Instead, you go after things that help average American families, that go after American workers. This is wrong. I urge my colleagues to vote against this rule, which is not open, and I urge my colleagues to vote against the underlying bill, and I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida. Madam Speaker, as you heard me say earlier, my Republican colleagues and I are committed to providing a more accountable, transparent, open process than the minority allowed during previous Congresses. Today's bill is another step in that right direction and an example of the House Republicans' commitment to, to reform the way things are done here in Washington. The underlying bill has partisan, bipartisan support. It went through the regular order and it was provided a structure rule to allow Republicans and Democrats to, uh, alike to offer amendments, ideas, and an open, honest debate. While I'm supportive of the underlying legislation, this vote on this rule that provides an open and transparent process, which allows 33 amendments from both sides of the aisle, where ideas and policies will rise and fall based on their merit and not on any particular sponsor's party affiliation. This is what the American people expect in their elected officials. I'd like to introduce to you one of the new, uh, new Americans uh, that was born last night at 1050. This is Claire. She's our seventh granddaughter. And we're excited about her. And she, just like the rest of the Americans, believe that the expectation is being fulfilled by this rule the rule that we have here before us, and that is that we will have an opportunity to express ourselves in a real, tra transparent, open way on amendments and the underlying bill and have the opportunity to pre present ourselves uh, and afford ourselves to the chance to vote on each one of those proposals. So I encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting the passage of this rule. I yield back the balance of my time and I move the previous question on the resolution. A uh, gentleman yields back without objection. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Oh. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted and without Ma objection. Speaker, I ask for the gentleman uh, from I for Massachusetts. Roll call. Yeas and nays. Yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, this 15-minute vote on adoption of the resolution will be followed by a five-minute vote on the motion to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 872. That vote. The House begins debate on what's expected to be a full afternoon of debate on the FAA authorization bill. This is a vote on the rule for that bill. The rule would allow for an hour general debate, and the House will consider some 33 amendments to that bill if the uh, rule is passed. One more vote will follow this, and that's on a bill they debated late yesterday dealing with the EPA's regulation of pesticides on navigable waters. But the underlying legislation for the rest of this afternoon anyway, the FAA reauthorization bill, we spoke to a reporter just a short while ago for some background on the bill. With us is Jennifer Michaels, editor of Aviation Daily. What sorts of FAA policies or programs does this bill cover? Um, well, you know, in addition to the overall bill uh, establishes you know, funding levels for FAA operations, and it modernizes the air traffic control system, which a major portion of that is uh, moving forward what we call next gen, the next generation satellite-based ATC system, which is going to make our, you know, control towers and, and flights a lot more efficient. Um, but in addition to that, there's so many, um, you know, more down-in-the-weeds issues uh, that are going to affect everyday flying passengers. There's labor issues. There's uh, essential air service to smaller airports. You know, I could just jump in and pick one of those, or I didn't know if you had them. Well, what, what, would you, what would you say are some of the more controversial ones that uh, we should keep our eye out for? I would say definitely we need to watch and see what happens with the labor provision. Um, what is in the House bill right now is a provision that would overturn something that the National Mediation Board did last year. It held hearings. There was a lawsuit. And basically what happens is uh, the airlines are against this, this new NMB ruling, which essentially makes it easier to unionize at an airline. Um, Chairman Micah spoke yesterday at the uh, Aero Club of Washington, by the way, and he says 
He predicts that that's going to come out of the bill. That's going to be a major sticking point. He predicts it's going to come out, but let me just say he uh, also clarified that he's very much in support of this provision, staying in the bill, and he's going to try to fight perhaps through other venues to overturn this NMB ruling from last year. But the Obama administration has weighed in with a veto threat. Does that have to do with this provision? It does. It does indeed. Because, you know, basically uh, we let we let the, you know, the government take its course last year. The National Mediation Board is what oversees airline elections. They went through this. They held hearings, you know, for for some time last year. And you know, they went through this and now Congress wants to legislate this. And so labor didn't really see this coming a couple of months ago. And so they have been lobbying very heavy to, to make sure that this doesn't happen. Well, outside of uh, uh, that amendment, this provision, what else does the aviation industry say about the the overall reauthorization bill? You know, the, sort of the, main, the main gist of it is when you look at it, airlines are basically happy. There's no, there's no increase in taxes that may have come come down the line, such as increase in fuel taxes. Airports are seeing a huge hit in funding for airport improvement programs, so they've been trying to get those levels back up. The Senate version of the bill uh, gives, gives more money to airports, but uh, it's, it's going to be a real fight in conference to try and square these two bills. We have a two-year Senate bill, we have a four-year House bill, and the Senate bill goes back to fiscal 2010. So basically the Senate two-year bill ends at the end of this year. So it's going to be hard comparing apples and oranges and squaring those funding levels. You mentioned uh, Transportation Chairman John Micah. Who else? What are the other, some of the other key House lawmakers you'll be keeping your eye on during debate? Um, there are uh, Jerry Costello, and um, he, he has some, I believe he was the EA, EAS, Essential Air Service. Actually, I'd have to look back and see if he's the one who offered that amendment. But we have... We have this, this fight to kill the Essential Air Service program, which basically subsidizes uh, service to smaller airports. You know, if you live two hours from an airport, right. um, the EAS program basically pays, pays airlines to serve those airports. Otherwise, they wouldn't make any money, and you'd, you know, you'd probably have a longer drive. So Senator McCain on the Senate side was trying to kill that program, saying, it's, you know, it's just providing subsidies we don't need at this time and it's about a 200 million dollar per year program so that's that's one of the issues that we'll be that we'll be watching and uh you know in conference we've got Jay Rockefeller and Kay Bailey Hutchison who have really worked some of the major sticking points uh this whole thing called the DCA slot issue which would allow more service in and out of Washington National Airport to to far, farther points such as the west coast that's another. Uh... Well, Jennifer Michaels with uh, Aviation Daily, editor of Aviation Daily, keeping an eye on the FAA debate in the House. We thank you for that update. You're welcome. And just a follow up on that uh, aviationnews.net reports an amendment that was drafted by Bill Schuster of Pennsylvania to ensure $200 million in annual funding for the Essential Air Service program was withdrawn from consideration. At Schuster's request, they write that during the Rules Committee hearing yesterday, Schuster noted that the amendment would likely have been considered, quote, out of order because it would increase the overall cost of the bill in violation of House rules. The underlying House FAA reauthorization bill proposes to phase out the EAS program over the next three years, except for communities in Alaska and Hawaii. Here on the House floor, this is the rule vote for that FAA authorization bill. And this is a 15-minute vote. The rule passes. There will be an hour of general debate and 33 amendments. Also on Capitol Hill today, lots of discussion about the fiscal year 2011 spending bill. The current short-term bill expires next Friday, April the 8th. Lots of things going on on Capitol Hill with former Speaker Newt Gingrich meeting with House freshmen this morning, House GOP freshmen. There was a rally by the Tea Party Patriots on the budget on Capitol Hill at noon today. Vice President Biden was on the Hill yesterday in negotiations and meeting today with uh, the budget director, Jack Lew. John Boehner, the House Speaker, held a briefing at about noon today, too, where he said that no final deal has been reached over the uh, 2011 federal spending levels. He has said, he did say, that there had been an agreement, uh, not been an agreement, on a set of numbers that House Republicans, and Republicans are going to fight for all the spending cuts they can get 
The House passed that bill, H.R. 1, $61 billion in cuts uh, last month, but Senate Democrats have said they will not take up that measure. John Boehner spoke to reporters again about noon today. We're going to show you his briefing. It's just under 10 minutes. Morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Uh, let me start with uh, an important issue that are facing uh, the American people every day, and that's rising gas prices. I was interested uh, yesterday to see the president uh, talk about uh, uh, this issue, but I think he left me with more questions than he did answer. You know, why just days after vowing uh, to buy more oil from Brazil would the president urge a reduction in oil imports? And why would he be so enthusiastic about Brazil exploring its natural resources while the administration does everything in its power to block energy production here at home? Uh, here in the House, we've got a clear plan to develop job-creating, homegrown energy and stop the policies uh, that are driving up gas prices, and it's called the American Energy Initiative. <coughs> this week, the Natural Resources Committee put forward three strong proposals to expand American energy production. The Energy and Commerce Committee passed a bill that would prevent the EPA uh, from imposing a backdoor energy tax. And the majority leader said it would come up for a vote soon. This is important because when we're talking about energy, we're not talking about just high gas prices. We're also talking about American jobs. And by expanding American energy production, we can create more jobs, lower costs, and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Uh, just as our work on energy is about jobs, uh, so is our effort uh, to end the spending binge here in Washington. The excessive government spending is creating uncertainty for small businesses, reducing uh, confidence, and crowding out uh, private investment that's needed to create jobs in our country. It's now been 40 days since the House passed H.R. 1, uh, which keeps the government open and cuts spending uh, for the rest of this fiscal year. Forty days, and Senate Democrats still have not passed a bill or come up with a credible plan to reduce spending. And I think it's important for the American people to understand how we got here. Last spring, uh, the Democrat majority failed to pass a budget uh, in the House for the Senate. Uh, they thought they could just leave spending on autopilot. Uh, earlier this year, when we made it clear that we would listen to the American people and cut spending, Senate Democrats started the uh, started their negotiations with, no, we're not going to have any spending cuts at all. Well, we passed a straightforward bill to cut spending and did it through an open process. And still, Senate Democrats did nothing. Then we passed uh, $10 billion worth of spending cuts over the last five weeks. Still no plan from the Senate and no bill. Only a port rhetoric portraying the American people as extreme. Now, here's the bottom line. Democrats are rooting for a government shutdown. Uh, we're listening to the people who sent us here to cut spending so that we can grow our economy. As I said at the beginning, our goal is to cut spending, not shut down the government. And you've heard uh, a lot of talk over the last 24 hours. There's no agreement on numbers, and nothing will be agreed to until everything is agreed to. Uh, we control one half of one third of the government here. Uh, but we're going to continue to fight for the largest spending cuts that we can get uh, to keep the government open and funded through the balance of this fiscal year. What is the argument that you'll be making to some of your more junior members and your real conservatives uh, in favor of <coughs> something that moves off of H.R. 1? Uh, we're going to fight for H.R. 1. It's what the House passed. It's the only bill to fund the government through September 30th that's passed either House. It's our position, and we're going to continue to fight for everything that's in it. Mr. Leader. Mr. Mr. Speaker, a couple blocks away, Tea Partiers are forming to hold a rally, the sixth rally. Uh, they're saying no compromise. Many of them, at least some of them, are saying they're unhappy with some of the action you've taken. They see you, you, you moving too far off with the number they want. Some even suggest that there will be a primary challenge to you next year. What do you say to the Tea Partiers? Listen, I'm glad that they're here, and I'm glad that they're engaged in the process. You know, I said uh, over a year ago uh, that we should uh, talk with the Tea Party folks, uh, that we should listen to them, and we should walk mm -hmm. amongst them. Uh, I don't feel any differently about it today. Uh, anytime Americans want to engage in their government, 
Uh, and today, I believe we have more Americans engaged in our government than at any time in our history. Uh, we should welcome that. Mr. 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 Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Democrats and uh, Democrats put out a, a statement this morning saying that the Democrats and Republicans have agreed on cuts worth 73 billion below the president's budget proposal. You're saying there's no agreement. So where is the disconnect? There is no agreement on a set of numbers, and nothing will be agreed to until everything's agreed to. I've said it, and I'm going to continue to say it because that is the fact. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, are there level, uh, levels of spending cuts directly tied to what type of riders would be approved? I'm not going to get into the negotiations here. The House passed H.R. 1. Uh, we've put our spending cuts on the table. Uh, we've put our spending limitations on the table. Uh, the Senate Democrats have not. So they have no position. And we're going to fight for what we passed in the House. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, do you think that there will be a deal? But you're, you're not... You're not going to get into the negotiations, but can you characterize how the negotiations are going between the House and the Senate right now? We're talking. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> do you think that there will be a deal before April 8th, before the government funding expires? I would hope so. The sooner we get this finished, uh, the sooner we can get on to dealing with the really big issues uh, that affect our country. We've got big challenges facing our country. Uh, and I think it's time to, to move to a budget. Uh, try to get an agreement with the Senate on a budget uh, that will really transform uh, the, uh, the entitlement programs that are continuing uh, to drive the budget deficit in, into the range that we're in today. And have you talked to, uh, to, to Vice President Biden since he made his statement last night? Since he said essentially there was a deal or there was a number? I have not talked to him since last night. And do you have I any can't plans confirm that. Mr. Speaker, do you think that there is anything that, especially the freshman Republicans, could abide? that is anything less than H.R. 1. Anything, I mean, you know, and they're asking for more. They're asking for the, the writer, you know, the writers. You have the Tea Party. I'm well aware. I'm well aware. Of, <laughs> there are a lot of people in Washington who want us to do a lot of different things. We promised the American people uh, that we would fight to cut spending, and that is what we're doing. But only that H.R. 1. That seems like your, your position is steeled, and you can't move off that. Uh, we are going to fight for all of the spending cuts that we can get. But Speaker Bader, Speaker Bader, H.R. 1 already failed in the Senate. So whatever you're going to negotiate, even though you say there's not a number, is going to be, could be as much as $30 billion less than H.R. 1. What do you say to those Tea Party activists who are very unhappy that you're going to... We control one half of one-third of the government here in Washington. Uh, we can't impose our will on another body. We can't impose our will on the Senate. All we can do... Uh, is to fight for all of the spending cuts that we can get an agreement to, and the spending limitations as well. Last question. Speaker, Speaker, Speaker. How willing are you to um, leave your conservative uh, colleagues behind and form a coalition with Democrats as you did to pass the previous stopgap measure? Not very interested. Thank you. How much are you willing to raise the debt ceiling? Are the Reds going to have a good year? <laughs> <laughs> Speaker Boehner, from about midday today, Word is that he's going to meet with uh, House Republican freshmen later on this afternoon. On the House floor now, they're voting on the rule for the FAA reauthorization bill. That would allow for an hour of general debate, and they will consider 33 amendments if the uh, rule is passed. About that $33 billion figure that's out there in terms of the budget cuts for the remainder of fiscal year 2011, you heard John Boehner talk and answer some of the reporters' questions on that. Shortly after his midday news conference, we spoke with a Capitol Hill reporter who's been covering the budget negotiations. Jim Rowley of Bloomberg News covering the fiscal year 2011 spending negotiations. Vice President Biden says negotiators have settled on a target of $33 billion in spending cuts for the rest of the fiscal year. House Speaker John Boehner said earlier today there is no deal, so where's the truth? Well, Speaker Boehner didn't deny that there's a discussion going on. In fact, he said we're talking. And uh, Vice President Biden issued the same caution, almost the same formulation of words when, they, when he said that there's no deal until all the numbers and everything is agreed to. And uh, that same caution was issued this morning by the Speaker. What sort of pressures is uh, Speaker Boehner under from conservative members and the Tea Party? Well, conservative members really want to get as close to the $61 billion figure that the House passed in spending cuts as they can. And the Tea Party people want uh, instant results in terms of spending cuts. And, and Boehner was 
took great pains today to, to, to warn people that because the Republicans only control one house, one half of one third of the government, as he put it, uh, it can't, as, she, as he said again, impose its will on the Senate. So he's sort of warning them that though you might want to get is everything we passed, it's just not going to be possible. And that sort of warning is not something we've heard in the past from Speaker Boehner, correct? Well, he's made those statements before, but more in a kind of a more theoretical thing. The fact that he's saying them today, I think, is significant because he's he's preparing the groundwork for, for uh, acceptance of this deal. Well, tell us how negotiators are focused on on that, that figure, that $33 billion figure. How do, they, how do they arrive at that number? Well, the administration came up with a, an offer of uh, $20 billion in additional cuts from what uh, the Senate had accepted in the previous short-term uh, stopgap spending bills, which basically added up to about 11, so 11 or 12. So the 20 takes it to, uh, to about $33 billion uh, with some rounding there. And uh, some of it includes, I believe, some mandatory spending cuts, which may not be uh, – considered by the Congressional Budget Office as direct uh, uh, savings this year. They might be over time. Well, John Boehner keeps talking about um, uh, spending limitations. What does he mean by those? Spending limitations are what they call riders, where, uh, for instance, there was a, 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 an amendment on the, on the bill which passed in the House which said that no money can be used to implement the uh, health care law that was passed last year. So these are those so-called policy writers. We policy have. writers. There's another one that says that no money can be given to disperse to Planned Parenthood because the anti-abortion people won't want to make sure that none of the money that, that the government uh, hands to Planned Parenthood is used to, to provide abortion services. So there's a whole, there's a number of them. There's one that would, would prohibit EPA from enforcing the uh, any greenhouse gas emission regulations that it's, that it's formulating. Well, look ahead to, to next week, if you can. If, if the Republicans continue to insist on H.R. 1, the $61 billion in spending cuts, does that mean the government's going to shut down after next Friday? Well, if there's no deal and no deal in sight, uh, it could mean that it would likely mean that the government would shut down. Uh, from what we know now, there's, there's active negotiations going on, and the speaker said he hoped we could reach a deal. He's, he also said, look, we've got to move on so we can deal with the big problems of the budget for the next year and the entitlement programs and so forth. So he's offering sort of a carrot to people. Let's, you know, let's put this behind us so we can tackle the really big problems that face the country, as he put it. And I think that if there were, if there were still dotting the I's and crossing the T's next week at this time, they would probably – ask people to approve a, another short-term thing to get them through a few days or something like that. Jim Rowley of Bloomberg News with the latest on the fiscal year 2011 spending negotiations. Thanks for that update. My pleasure. And back live on the House floor, this is the rule vote for the FAA reauthorization bill. An hour of general debate if it's approved and consideration of 33 amendments. It's likely that the House won't finish work on this bill this afternoon. One more vote will follow this, and that's a vote on a bill they debated yesterday dealing with the um, EPA's regulation of pesticides on, uh, on navigable waters. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill today, Secretary Gates, the Defense Secretary, and Admiral Michael Mullen making two appearances talking about Libya policy. This morning they were before the House Armed Services Committee. This afternoon they're testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Also today, Dennis Kucinich, congressman from Ohio, spoke about Libya for just about an hour using a point of personal privilege shortly after they gaveled in at noon Eastern. And you can find that speech on our website and our video library at cspan.org. Also some thoughts on Libya from members on the Hill. Buck McKeon, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, tweets a short while ago that a new Rasmussen poll shows only 21% of those polled think the U.S. has a clearly defined mission in Libya. Meanwhile, Gregory Meeks of, uh, of New York saying that he's looking forward to hearing from the administration of their plan for laying the groundwork for political options in Libya. Once again, that hearing with Admiral Mullen and Secretary Gates, the second hearing of the day, that's underway now, and it's on our companion network, C-SPAN 3.
both the yeas are 249, the nays are 171. Resolution is, adop is adopted without objection. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gibbs, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 872 as amended, on which the yeas and the nays were ordered. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 872, a bill to amend the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act and the Federal Water Pollution Control Act to clarify congressional intent regarding the regulation of the use of pesticides in or near navigable waters and for other purposes. Question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device as a five-minute vote. And this is a, a vote on a bill to curb the Environmental Protection Agency's regulation of pesticides. Five-minute vote and they debated this yesterday. Still to come, an hour of general debate. That's the rule they just approved, an hour of general debate for the Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization bill. And they will consider some 33 amendments. David Hawkins in his CQ Roll Call Daily Briefing writes that the most contentious vote will be on whether to limit union organizing by airline and railway employees. Consideration of amendments will end before 7 and resume tomorrow, he writes. We showed you John Boehner just a few minutes ago in his briefing today. Speaker Boehner tweeting a short while ago that GOP freshmen have returned to the Senate doorstep to uh, pass a bill so we can cut spending and help jobs. And the, the story there is that for the second straight day, freshmen Republican lawmakers led by Rick Crawford marched over to the Senate to deliver a message uh, to uh, Senator Reid for passing the bill that the House passed now 40 days ago. That's H.R. Uh, 1, the $61 billion dollar uh, cut from uh, uh, from a month ago or so. Anyway, still to come, debate, lots of it, on the FAA.
yeas are 292, the nays are 130. Two thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Please take your conversations off the floor. The House will come to order. House will come to order. Please take your conversations off the floor. For what purpose does Mr. Michael rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a unanimous consent request. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on H.R. 658 and include extraneous materials in the congressional record. Objection. Additional request. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the exchange of letters between the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Jim, I will suspend. Will the House please come to order? Gentlemen can continue. Again, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the exchange of letters between the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and the Committee on Judiciary and the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology be included in the record. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 189 in Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 658. The Chair appoints the gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Emerson, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. House will be in order. Chair asks that the House please be in order. The members take conversations from the floor. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 658, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to amend Title 49, United States Code, to authorize appropriations for the Federal Aviation Administration for fiscal years 2011 through 2014 to streamline programs, create efficiencies, reduce waste, and improve aviation safety and capacity to provide stable funding for the national aviation system and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. General debate shall be confined to the bill and amendments specified in House Resolution 189 and shall not exceed one hour with 40 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Ten minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Science, Space and Technology. And ten minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means. Gentlemen from Florida, Mr. Micah, and the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Rahal, each will control 20 minutes. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. 
the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, each will control five minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. In, any time you want. Gentlemen's recognized. Madam, Madam Chairman, uh, I uh, yield myself as much time as I must, may consume. Uh, will the gentleman suspend for just a moment, please? The committee will be in order. The committee will be in order. Will members please take their conversations off of the floor? Gentleman from Florida. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the House, the first thing I'd like to do is ask for unanimous consent to insert at this point in the record the letters that I referenced uh, earlier. The, general, uh, the gentleman's request will be covered under general leave. Thank the uh, chair. The legislation before us now is uh, the chair has uh, indicated is uh, the FAA Reauthorization and Reform Act of 2011. Uh, during the discussion on the rule which brought the, uh, the measure to the floor, I uh, had an opportunity to speak on the fairness of the rule. And again, I'll cite uh, having been here for a number of years and observed the process for three decades. Uh, I rarely find any time in which uh, everyone has had a fair opportunity to offer amendments. Some 48 amendments were offered uh, before the Rules Committee. Uh, some uh, 33 were accepted. Nine were withdrawn, so there are only six that were not considered, some for germaneness reasons, some for uh, being duplicative, and also in fairness to members to have an opportunity uh, to participate. Uh, so, again, I think that the process we come forward is very fair. The process has been uh, fair and bipartisan in the committee. Now, in the last four years, uh, uh, as the ranking Republican, Republican leader of the committee, I can count on probably less than three fingers the number of votes that we had over the four years. Uh, we had many more votes than that in uh, the committee. It was an open process and people had the opportunity uh, to participate. Then I also spoke in the rule of how we, we, we got ourselves in this predicament. I had the honor and privilege of being the uh, chair of the Aviation Subcommittee after uh, the beginning of 9-11 and through the fateful time of 9-11 uh, for some six years. In 2003, we passed the last authorization for FAA. Now, in order to operate the federal government and each of its agencies and activities, the Congress must authorize the programs, the policies, the agencies, the funding uh, formulas, and the projects that are eligible for federal participation. As I also stated, uh, the other side of the aisle for four years had huge majorities, could pass anything that they wanted to. Very large majorities in the House, large uh, majority in the Senate. And the last two years, indeed, they control the White House, the House, and the Senate could pass anything they want. In 2007, the bill that I helped author, a four-year authorization, expired. For the last four years, they, they did 17 extensions in four years. There, it's no wonder that people don't have jobs. It's no wonder that people in the aviation industry don't know which way the federal, men is, federal government is coming or going. It's no wonder that you have some disarray in one of our most, most important agencies, the FAA. Now, they had four years. We've had less than four months. We're bringing the bill out. We've had a fair process in the committee. And we've had an opportunity for people to offer amendments. And we'll spend most of today and maybe part of tomorrow going through those amendments. And I think an adequate time uh, for debate. Uh, the, the bill uh, does make some 
uh, reductions in spending, and it does take us back to the 2008 level of spending. Now, the first thing you'll hear from the other side is, oh, the Republicans are cutting and slashing uh, important uh, FAA programs and safety and uh, security and everything under the sun will be at risk. I, I can tell you that that's not the case. I can tell you you can do more with less and we can prioritize. In fact, in this bill, to make certain that safety is our primary concern and it must be our primary concern, that we have put specific provisions in here that if there are cuts or reductions, and heaven knows the FAA and the Department of Transportation certainly can have some reductions in bureaucratic staffing. My dad used to say, and uh, when he was alive, he said, son, it's not how much you spend, it's how you spend it. And it's just like that with personnel. Uh, people will say, well, we're not going to have enough air traffic controllers. And we just had the incident out at uh, Reagan. We had an uh, air traffic controller with some uh, 20 years experience, 17 years at DCA, and uh, came to work, I guess, at 10 o'clock. There was somebody there till almost 10.30. So I understand he was there an hour and 28 minutes and either fell asleep or wasn't uh, doing his d duty. So in Washington, what did they do? Like, we got to double up. We got to have more employees. Now listen to this statistic. Listen to this statistic. Since before two th 2001, we have a 21% uh, decrease. Since before, t if we go to 2001 to today, we have a 21% decrease uh, in air traffic movements. Why? Because the industry's consolidated. We don't have as many flights. The economy's down. At the same time, we have an increase in 20% of staffing. So uh, if you look at, at, at uh, airports around the country, you'll see some with huge reductions in air traffic and still the same number of air traffic controllers. So in this bill, we give some flexibility so you can hopefully move people around. Now, I know there are labor agreements, and it's hard to get people to move. And some people might not like the warm climes and beauty of Florida, where the population has expanded in Arizona and wherever else we need them. But for heaven's sakes, do we need to double up? Do we need to double up when there's no air traffic at most of these airports between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m.? That's the Washington, big spending, big government, let's add more. So I can tell you that there's plenty of room for doing things responsibly, doing things with, the, with the, uh, safety in mind, doing things, now let's try a new approach with the best interests of the taxpayer. Uh, they spent some $5.3 billion in about 24 months more than we take in. We're on the verge of having our financial security of this nation at risk, also threatening even our, our, uh, the, the, the defense security of this nation. Now, again, 17 times they did these little hiccup uh, extensions costing millions of dollars. Just ask, ask the FAA administrator, the recalculation, all the things that had to be done, the inability to move forward with safety programs for that matter. So I, I just want to make the point that we, we can accomplish what we've set out, a reduction in spending and actually better uh, performance and better safety. I could give more examples. I don't have a lot of time. We used to chase developmental programs, and the government would try to develop technology for air traffic control, and they'd take forever, and the private sector would develop technologies they do it sooner, faster, with better, with more, with more capability while they're still spending billions of dollars recklessly and we reduced actually the amount of money in those developmental programs and we actually put, have put out their uh, technology faster, better. So there are many areas and I can't spend all my time talking about them, but this is uh, a job creation bill, 9.2% of the domestic, gross domestic uh, activity in this, in this nation depends on this uh, industry. We, uh, we count on this 
And as, as I said, in less than four months, the other body, the Senate, has already passed the bill. We're ready to go to conference. We've asked for one extension to accomplishment, accomplish this, and this bill has excellent uh, provisions. Now you hear, finally you'll hear them moan and groan about some labor uh, provision that we're, uh, someone described that we're taking away democratic rights and all of this uh, for union members. Couldn't be further from the truth. We have had 70 some years of, of rules under uh, organizing for labor where we've always had a majority of those who were affected have to vote in a, a union. Uh, now they want to change it to whoever shows up. They have multiple elections uh, and that's what they're asking for. Little caveat here and I hope uh, everyone's listening Madam Chair. What they didn't do is to decertify to get out of the union. They left the old rule in place that has to be uh, a majority of everyone who's affected. Uh, and they'll tell you that, uh, you know, that they didn't let women vote and all of this a long time ago. Try to, try to uh, mix up the uh, topic at hand and confuse people. But you can't think of a more unfair rule than a packed national mediation board has enacted. Unfair, uh, easy to enter in, cut the uh, cut the provisions for entering in, and then uh, put, the, put a barrier up to, uh, to get out. Uh, again, uh, I think this is an excellent program. It gives us opportunities to look at contract towers and then uh, air traffic control, next gen, uh, the next generation of air traffic control. Uh, can, uh, we can do better. We can get technology in place. We'll probably have to use fewer people and we'll always know where the planes are if we could move this legislation forward that again has been on the shelf for some four years. Uh, so there are excellent provisions in this legislation. Uh, I feel confident that it deserves the support of the House and we'll have fair and open debate on amendments and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman, gentleman reserves, a gentleman from West Virginia. Madam Chair, I was, uh, you and myself, such time as may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. Madam Chair, it was just last week two airliners landed at Washington National Airport without landing clearances because apparently the single person in charge of the control tower fell asleep. While investigations are ongoing, we certainly have seen accidents in the past where controller staffing and fatigue were implicated, such as the August 06 crash of Comair Flight. 5191 in Lexington, Kentucky. So I was uh, surprised when some of my Republican colleagues used this most recent incident at Washington National Airport as an opportunity to argue that the FAA should do more with less. Do more with less. That's how the Republicans think the FAA will operate under this bill. When we're talking about investing in air traffic control modernization or regulating safety or hiring a sufficient number of safety inspectors, there's no such thing as doing more with less. Under this bill, the FAA will have to do less with less, and you would have to be asleep at the controls not to see that. The FAA is primarily a safety agency, and virtually all of its activities are safety related. As last week's incident should make clear, now is not the time to arbitrarily cut almost $4 billion from the FAA programs and argue that the agency can do more with less on safety. A long-term FAA reauthorization bill must move the aviation system into the 21st century, create jobs, strengthen our economy, and provide the resources necessary to enhance safety. This legislation unfortunately does not meet those goals. It will require significant changes before it can be enacted into law, and therefore I cannot support it. One thing we should all be honest about right now, this is not a jobs bill. The bill cuts FAA funding by billions of dollars, back to zero eight levels. You cannot cut funding so dramatically without destroying tens of thousands of jobs. Federal jobs, state jobs, local jobs, public and private sector jobs. 
In addition to costing jobs, the bill's funding cuts would cause delays to air traffic control modernization, meaning more delayed flights, a reduction of FAA safety workforce, and delays to FAA safety rules. Now, aside from the funding levels, there are two particular issues that preclude my support for this bill. The first is that the bill sunsets the essential air service program for the lower 48 states in 2013, leaving behind about 110 communities across the country. Yet at the same time, the bill extends airport improvements to the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau. We do not even own them. They are independent countries. Now, I do understand the reasons for providing airport improvement funds to these island nations. We do have a compact with them. But in seeking to keep faith with our agreements with those countries, the majority is more than willing to break the promise to rural America right here at home that was made under the Airline Deregulation Act and the FAA reauthorization bills that followed. EAS is a vital lifeline between rural communities and the global network of commerce. Small and rural communities have grown up around EAS, which directly supports local jobs. It creates a flow of goods and commerce into and out of small town America, brings families together. It links four communities in my home state of West Virginia with other cities and towns around the country and around the world. Essential Air Service is an investment. It's not a handout. It is an investment in jobs and economic growth for small towns. The majority is turning its back on small towns and rural America. I will continue to work with my colleagues in a bipartisan fashion to honor the promise that Congress has made to the people in rural America. I recognize the job protecting benefits of the EAS program and the value of critical federal investment for rural communities. Now before I conclude, there is another section that has no business whatsoever in being in this bill. And that is the provision that seeks to overturn a rule finalized by the National Mediation Board on fair union representation in elections. The rule did away with an unjust and undemocratic requirement under which a supermajority of airline and railroad workers had to vote in favor of union representation before a union could be certified to represent them at the bargaining table. Non-votes were counted as no votes even though there was no reason to conclude workers were against union representation because they were sick or on furlough and did not vote. The new rule, which this bill would overturn, says that the Mediation Board must count the votes among those employees who voted and must determine the will of the workers according to the yes and no votes actually cast. Now, just as congressional elections turn on the majority of those who voted, Union representation elections should reflect the will of the voters. This is a poison pill provision. A provision to overturn that rule simply has no business being in this legislation. It has nothing to do with safety. It has nothing to do with improving our air transportation system. And it has absolutely nothing to do with making air service more efficient. Rather, it is a lightning rod of controversy, part of a concerted assault as we've seen too often this year on collective bargaining. Republicans and Democrats alike have opposed it. It barely survived in the committee markup by a single vote. This unprovoked and unnecessary provision has no place in such critically needed legislation to keep the FAA moving forward and the flying public safe. When it comes to do more, doing more with less, my friends on the other side of the hour are correct about a few things, I have to admit when it comes to the pending legislation. More than 70,000 jobs lost with less funding for the AIP program. More risk for the traveling public with less safety personnel and initiatives. More assaults on collective bargaining rights for American workers. More controversial poison pill provisions with less focus on job creation and safety enhancements. Yep, that's doing more with less. With warning lights flashing and alarm bells ringing, we cannot afford to go to sleep at the controls. It's such an important time for our aviation system, and I reserve the balance of my time. Reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Florida. Reminding uh, everyone that we're borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar, I'm pleased to yield to the uh, chair of the aviation subcommittee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Petri. Gentlemen, four minutes. Gentlemen from Wisconsin is recognized for four minutes. Uh, 
I thank my chairman. The legislation before us, H.R. 658, reauthorizes the safety and research programs, operations, airport grants, and funding of the Federal Aviation Administration for budget years 2011 through 2014. It's a four-year reauthorization with no earmarks that will result in savings and in great efficiencies. The bill funds the FAA at the uh, fiscal year 2008 funding levels and will save $4 billion compared to the current levels. These funding levels recognize the state of the federal budget but should not affect vital safety functions. The FAA Administrator is directed to achieve required cost savings without cutting safety critical activities. The bill requires the FAA to find and eliminate wasteful processes, duplicative programs and unnecessary practices. Given current economic times, there is a need to put our limited resources where they are most needed and use them efficiently. Although we cannot do all that we may have wanted to do when fighting budget cuts, difficult decisions have to be made. We have worked to preserve the ability of the FAA to conduct its safety functions, its most important mission and our number one priority. The bill will phase out the Essential Air Service Program by 2013, resulting in $400 million in savings. The Essential Air Service Program was originally created in 1970 as a temporary program in the wake of airline deregulation. It was intended to allow airports to adapt to the change in the aviation industry and to plan accordingly. However, over the years, this program has resulted in taxpayers paying millions of dollars in subsidies to provide air service to communities even as passenger emplanements have declined as other modes of transportation have become available. With regard to NextGen, H.R. 658 streamlines processes and provides sufficient funding with FAA purse strings tightening to fund NextGen projects planned in the next four years. It sets strict goals and benchmarks and includes other measures to accelerate NextGen in order to keep the momentum going. NextGen is critical to the U.S.'s ability to compete in the global aviation system by providing safer, more efficient and environmentally friendly operations. The bill allows for expansion of the cost-effective contract tower program, which has the potential to save roughly $400 million over four years. In addition, the legislation provides a clear and efficient process for the FAA to rapidly achieve benefits associated with the consolidation of old, obsolete and unnecessary FAA facilities with enormous potential savings. I'd like to commend Chairman Micah for his efforts in developing this bill and moving it through the committee. And also, while we have, may, may have differences on a few provisions, there is much in this bill that has bipartisan support. I look forward to continuing to work with my aviation partner, Representative Jerry Costello, and our ranking mem member, Nick Ray Hall, in getting agreement with the Senate so we can finally send a bill to the President. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 658, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from West Virginia. Madam Chair, our leading Democrat on the aviation.